We do have to unfortunately start the show with uh, the passing of Robert Miller, uh, Bushwhacker Butch, uh, half of the uh, the Sheep Herders. Uh, he passed away over WrestleMania weekend. He was actually there, correct? He was at one of the hotels, yeah. if I remember correctly, there, and, and, and unfortunately passed. Uh, he, of course, is most famous for his run as you know half of the Bushwhackers in the WWF. Uh, but him and his his career and and the team's career is so much larger than that. And I think that's what we really want to do here because a lot of other places you're going to listen to, if they even do mention it, are just going to talk about the Bushwhackers. And they're like, oh, haha, they were hilarious. And it's like they have such a larger career. I mean, uh, Robert Miller's career started in the early 60s and was going until like, I mean, God, I, I think the other, uh, Luke is still wrestling like today, right? Like Luke literally this weekend. actively... Luke has wrestled matches in 2023. Now, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I now I don't know. You know, is he just doing? I'm sure he's just doing comedy spots, and I'm sure he's not bumping or anything. But he has never stopped being booked for pro wrestling matches to this day, Luke. And Butch stopped working around 2001, 2002. So Luke outlasted Butch in the ring by about 20 years. But Butch had been kind of in bad health for a number of years. Yeah. He didn't look great. At the WWE Hall of Fame, God, that had to be what that that had to be almost ten years ago. So, oh, and they, yeah, I, I, um, I don't. Some people know their their WWE Hall of Fame. I don't. I don't it's recall when they got in. But oh, well, okay, all right. 20, so that's all. You know, that's like eight years ago, and he wasn't. Oh, I remember he was kind of hunched well over, and he looked he looked older. I mean, you could the the two of them, like one of them, looked like significantly older than the other. Yeah, and I, that yeah, okay. So that I do remember that now. Yeah. Um, so he was 78 years old because remember by the time they got to the WWF in 1989, they were already well into their forties. So they would have been 43, 44 years old by the time they got into the WWF. Actually it was late 88 because they were in the middle of the, uh, NWA us tag team title tournament at the time at the end of 88 for uh wcw and they 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 quit the promotion with no notice and jumped to wwf in the middle of the tournament and see if you could pull the brackets up because if i'm not mistaken they were still alive in the tournament yeah i believe i believe they were let me let me try to get it but i'm almost positive i read that earlier in doing some research that they were alive in the tournament and set up to be you know a big part of that but let me let me make sure i can find the exact bracket yeah and and i'll talk through it because they they were they were all set to set up another feud with the Fantastics, which was really their rivals for many, many years throughout the 80s. Uh, even different versions of the, the Sheep Herders were in feuds with the Fantastics. We covered one of their feuds with the Fantastics on one of our deep dives behind the paywall when we did the UWF Tag Team title deep dive, the 1986 UWF Tag Team deep dive. A lot of that is centered around the Fantastics and the Sheep Herders and all of those... Uh, uh, those New Zealand boot camp matches and the barbed wire cage matches that those two teams were having with one another, uh, which really took the Fantastics out of their element, having those sort of, you know, bloody hardcore bouts. But that was right up to Sheep Herders Alley. And that's why when a lot of fans of a certain age, you know, only knew of them as the Bushwhackers, and then people would always say, oh, these guys had a whole second life as the as the wild Sheep Herders who were like these original hardcore wrestlers and with their bloody brawls. They're, they're predominantly talking about the matches against the Fantastics is what people are remembering, you know, from Mid-South, uh, you know, around 86, mostly in 86 and, and you know, later on in eight. And I guess that feud really was 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 in 1986. But uh, but yeah, so they left. Did you find those tournament brackets? I no? can't find the brackets uh, oh. uh, themselves, but I do know they were going to face the Fantastics in the finals uh, of that tournament. I mean, that 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 oh, was. Oh, there you go. See, that's yeah, yeah. They they were alive. They were alive, and that was the the goal was to have the Fantastics face the Sheep Herders in the finals, and then they left. Yeah, and then and then from there, who knows who would have won the match because the U.S. tag titles were often centered around the Fantastics, you know. Um, so you know they probably would have had their their really what would have been their third feud but um yeah they ended up uh, they, they ended up beating jump. eddie gilbert and ron simmons eventually in the finals but i, I can't seem to find fantastic the full brex yeah the fantastics ended up beating them in the in the finals of that tournament and they were just a replacement i guess or, uh, or yeah I don't yeah know, but, it's, um, I, i'm trying to find i can, there's, there's there's a title I, history there's that great title histories website that has a list of all the tournaments too but you might not be able to find it on the spot like that but um 
the point here is they left in the middle of the tournament and were probably going to be major factors in the tournament. And they left in the middle of the tournament, which um, wasn't exactly doing business the right way. But uh, when Vince says, I need you to start in, you know, right now, you know, and, and you've got the most lucrative run of your career in front of you, you know, uh, I guess you do it. And that really was the most lucrative run of their careers. And they, they, they transitioned to the Bushwhacker gimmick, which was an undercard prelim comedy gimmick that I would assume most of the people listening to would be familiar with because they lasted well into the 90s. I mean, they lasted into 1996 as the Bushwhackers. So from late 88 to 96, and they were mainstays, and they were over, and they were over with kids, and they had a long run, and they probably made more money than they made in the rest of their career combined during those years, working all those pay-per-views and everything else. You know, they never got, got super high on the card, but they were always around, and they were always on the pay-per-views, and they were always on TV, and they worked all the house shows, so they made a shit ton of money working less than half as hard as they ever did before. I mean, they barely bumped. They did nothing but comedy spots, you know, the battering ram and, and you you could, you could think of all the spots, licking people coming down to the ring and, you know, the distinctive walk with the arms up and down and all that. So, um, you know, good for them in their forties and fifties, you know, making the big money after all those years of carving up their foreheads and doing all this just really insane shit, which as Rich said, goes all the way back to the 1960s when they started in New Zealand and then they were underneath guys in Australia for Jim Barnett for a while. And, and you know, they formed the tag team there. And you're like, they, they kicked around for many years in Southeast Asia and in, in Japan, even before New Japan and All Japan were a thing. Like, they, those guys, they were working Japan way back in, you know, the, the IWE days and shit like that. And, um, and you know, kicking around Oceania and Southeast Asia and what I did for our uh, match of the week this week was uh, I knew I was going to pick a sheep herders match. I just didn't know which one. And I went with their debut in Portland because a lot of people talk about that match and it's against Adrian Adonis and Ron Starr. And a lot of people talk about that match like it was their U.S. debut because if you listen to um, – Don Owens ring announcing. He announces it as that this is the, the the Kiwi. I forget what they were billed as. Uh, the Kiwi the Sherp, uh, sheep herders, I believe, is what they were called. I think. In yeah, Portland, and he but. says it's, and he announces it as their American debut, and in the commentary saying that as well, which isn't entirely true because they had worked the Hawaii territory a few months earlier in nineteen seven. This was nineteen seventy nine. So their their first matches in the U.S. were actually a, a, for a 50, 50 state uh, big time run, not Leia Maivia's promotion, which came later. The old NWA territory run by Ed Francis. Okay, that's where they worked first in the, in the United States in early nineteen seventy nine. And actually, if you watch that match that I have up for match of the week, if you listen to the post match promo, if you listen carefully, you can hear Butch say that they are the champions of New Zealand, Australia, and Hawaii. He mentions Hawaii. So, you know, that tells you, too, that, that, that they had been there. Now, they never actually won those version of the NWA tag team titles in Hawaii, but that was just the kind of embellishing that all of the territory guys did back in the day because who was going to fact check it? Right, no one's going to actually find that out. I mean, you could say literally anything, and 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 only your, your deepest of nerds would, would know, and even then it would be almost nearly impossible to figure that out. So, yeah, they, who cares? Say you're the champion yeah, of Hawaii. Who cares? <laughs> like one or two scattered newsletter readers in 1979 may have known that they were full of shit, that they won the titles in Hawaii. But, you know, um, they had worked a lot of Canada before that. I mean, they worked in um, a lot of stampede. They worked a lot of stampede. They worked. Stamp, they worked for Stu Hart. They worked across the country in Canada because they also worked Grand Prix, which I couldn't find any evidence but chances are they worked in the U.S. even before 1979 in Hawaii and Portland because Grand Prix used to run shows in Vermont. They used to run spot shows in Vermont. And as much as they worked in Grand Prix in the early and mid-70s, I would find it very hard to believe that they never got booked in Vermont. Now, do, do those match records exist? They don't. You know, I, I, am I going to sit here and tell you I researched it for a week? I did. And I looked for, you know, 10 minutes and couldn't find any evidence that they worked in Vermont. But 
just knowing what I know about the history of that territory and the territory at that time, I would be willing to bet that they worked Vermont sometime in the 70s before they went to Hawaii in 79. But that's neither here nor there. The point is I put up the 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 Portland match because that's widely regarded as their debut in the in the uh, continue the contiguous 48 state the yeah. lower 48 whatever you want to call it um they win that match the post match promo Adonis and Star and they admit hey we underestimated these I love the post did you watch it I love oh, the yeah, yeah, promo Oh yeah 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 I watched all like, that stuff yeah which is really another thing too that's cool about it if if you watch it is there's there's a pre match promo where they they talk about the uh, it's Adonis and Star talking about it. Adonis is like, oh, I'm sorry I let you down, but like I, I, I'm going to prove next time I'm going to do what I'm going to do, you know, sort of stuff like that. But what I love about it is the the sheep herders come in and they present them on Portland television like you've never seen these guys because this is their first, like you said, this is the first time they've ever we've ever seen them. This is the first time that they're ever on in, in America or whatever. But then what they do too that's cool about it is they still make them seem like a really big deal. They're like, well, we've all, we've heard a lot about these guys and they're in a main event. So they're obviously like, they're telling you, you know, like the, the dorks these days who would just cry and whine and bitch and moan. If we don't get a video, uh, like a 45 minute video package about every single person that debuts, here comes these guys out of nowhere that go to the right to the main event. And all that they have to do is say, Hey, we've heard a lot about it, These guys and Hey, they're in main events. So they must be important. You know what I mean? Like these guys must be important. They must be a big deal because they've come in here and they're already in main events and they're already going for our titles. So, yeah, it, all you had to do was present them as a big deal. And guess what? The fans were like, wow, these guys are a big deal because they're already in main events and the announcer's saying that they're a big deal. It, it's not that hard. You know, wrestling is Wait very, very Hold easy. On. There was no video package? The, no video packages at all. Don Owen just huh. said, these guys, we've heard a lot about these guys, but this is the first time that we're seeing them. But clearly they must mean something because they're already in the main events and they're already challenging for the title. And then guess yeah. what? The fans were going absolutely fucking nuts to see Adonis and Star beat these guys because these guys came and they were a threat to them immediately because they just came well, and they, they were a threat to them immediately. Uh, wild, wild. Well, they lost. Well, they won. The, the, the sheep herders won, right? And that—that's the other big key to it too, because they came, they came in, they talked them up on commentary, and then they beat the tag champs, and then Adonis and Star incensed because they're like, "Oh, we underestimated them. We won't let that happen again. We want them again. Next, we want you guys again next week." And then the sheep herders win the titles from them the next week yeah. so they not only hype them up as a big deal they then put them over the tag champs two weeks in a row right and then you know and then co- they, again commentary pointed first. that out too they said wow we didn't know who these guys were and we didn't know what they were capable of but they came in the first week we ever saw them and and, and beat our tag champions in the main event and now here they are again in a main event back-to-back weeks and now they're going for the titles and then when they win the titles they go wow <laughs> look these guys yeah. came in and they're running ruckshaw over the portland territory unbelievable so you know their big feud in portland was a little later with Piper and Martell. That was the big feud that really put them on the map. And, you know, I would I would guess is what really got them booked everywhere because then they literally went everywhere, whether it was they 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 would go to Puerto Rico probably uh you know a ha- at least a half a dozen different runs in Puerto Rico throughout their career. First time around 80 or 81, you know, they would go to uh they they were they went to Crockett um and then what happens is uh butch butch miller gets homesick and he wants to move back home so in 81 he moves back to new zealand and then is based out of new zealand and australia and he is replaced in the team by lord jonathan boyd so now it's lord jonathan boyd and luke williams and then they continue marching through the territories. They go to Memphis. They go to what later would become known as Continental, which at that time was probably fucking Southeastern or something like that. Um, this is where they first run into teams like the Fabulous Ones. And 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 they have, you know, and they, they have some of their, you know, early legendary feuds. But this is the, um, this is the Lord Jonathan Boyd, Luke Williams version. And eventually they end up in, in, uh, in the Joe Blanchard territory in San Antonio mm-hmm. in Southwest. And this is right around the time where Joe Blanchard has TV on USA network. Cause remember he was buying TV. He was paying weekly to air. He was on, he was on national TV airing on USA. And this was, you know, that San Antonio territory was a wild territory. They were about 10 years ahead of their time. You know what you would call hardcore wrestling today. Lots of blood. Lots of brawling, which fit the sheep herder gimmick to a T. And, you know, they won the tag titles, but then Boyd broke his leg. 
And when Jonathan Boyd broke his leg, Williams called Miller and Butch Miller came back to America and replaced Jonathan Boyd and the original sheep herders were back together. So Blanchard loses his TV to McMahon. He couldn't afford to pay the weekly fee and just business wasn't good. So USA went with McMahon. Uh, the rest of that history, you know, they're still on USA to this day. I guess they took a short break when they went to Spike or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah right, right, right. But but the point here is, you know, that was the genesis of Vince McMahon and his business relationship with USA. He actually replaced, you know, Joe Blanchard. And um, so Williams and Miller, they stuck around, but then Southwest was kind of dying. So, of course, where do they go? They go back to Puerto Rico, which was kind of their safety net. They they were always oh, con- because, again, Rich, what was the style in Puerto Rico? Oh, just brawls, you know, wild brawls, blood. Yeah. And, and and yeah, it's just exactly perfect it, for them. It, perfect for them. Yeah. And, and and there's there's a great playlist that I think you put up in our discord that I've been watching all day. And, and every one of their uh, the, every one of their Puerto Rico matches is like bell rings, a few little exchanges of holds. And then like you, you look down and then you look up and everyone's on the outside and everyone's bleeding and the fans are just going nuts. And it's just like, yep, that's perfect. That's exactly what, and these guys like, they're not, I, I wouldn't call them super workers by any means. Like they're, they're, they're certainly not, but there's a style that they have and it's, it's a frenetic pace style too. They're, they're not slow. They're not slow. It, it, it they're wild and chaotic brawls. Pretty much every one of the matches they have uh, in that entire playlist, which I think is like 49 matches deep. I mean, it's, it, it was supremely entertaining and, and it's a lot of matches um, I've seen for the first time ever. They're classic eighties brawling heels. I mean, there's an aura to them and they feel dangerous, right? And it's like, they're just ass kickers and they're not there to, to put on a top wrist lock. Okay. They're there to carve you up and beat you up. And, uh, you know, they're supposed to be intimidating and they come into these territories and they immediately mix it up with, you know, the, the baby face, quote unquote, blow job tag teams. And they, they make them work a different style and, and it works. So while they're in Puerto Rico on one of their runs, uh, Jonathan Boyd returns from his broken leg and he starts teaming with Rip Morgan. Now, Rip Morgan is the shoot nephew of Butch Miller. And was always associated with the act because depending on what territory, sometimes he would come in with them to certain territories and be the flag bearer. Right. Because like, you know literally, about the quite, sheep literally, murders, quite literally the flag bearer, in case you're wondering. <laughs> the guy who would come out with the New Zealand flag and wave it. Yes. Yeah. So they, they would always have a flag bearer. Sometimes it was Johnny Ace uh, later on in later years. But, you know, Rip Morgan was one of their flag bearers who certain territories would bring them in as a whole act. So what, 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 uh, what Boyd did was he's like, all right, well, Miller and Williams are in Puerto Rico. I'm going to form another version of the team with Rip Morgan. And it's not like they were a ripoff version or a copycat version because they were real sheep herders. Like Boyd was a legitimate member and Morgan was a legitimate member of the act. So what you had there for a couple of years in the mid eighties was the original sheep herders working in Puerto Rico. And then you had another version of the sheep herders, Jonathan Boyd and Rip Morgan working all the territories in the U S. So there were two versions of the sheep herders. <laughs> running around carving everybody up you know for like two years and this is where this was the this was feud number one with the fantastics because this is the the, the boyd morgan version had their first run in and feud with the fantastics um i believe in memphis you can fact check me on that but i think that was in memphis and then um because the fantastics hadn't formed until probably 85 until 85, I think, or late 84, 85, maybe. But um, they had feuded with the fabulous ones, and then that was the that was feud number one with the Fantastics. And then um, in 86, of course, because we talked about this earlier, uh, Williams and Miller come back to the United States, and they immediately go to work for Bill Watts, which at that t- by that time, I think, was already UW. I don't think it was Mid-South anymore. I think it was already UWF. 86 is UWF. Yeah, 86 is UWF. Yeah, so they're working for Watts, and they win the tag team titles. And that's where they have the second feud with the Fantastics, this time against Williams and Miller. And this is the famous Sheep Herders Fantastics feud that everybody talks about. And we reviewed a bunch of those matches on that deep dive. You remember those, those barbed wire cage matches? Oh, yeah, they fucking the, rock. Yeah, and the, the matches. Yeah. If, if you've never seen those, I mean, they're, they're such chaotic brawls that the two teams just start ripping the cage apart to hit each other with the cage. It's like how insane it gets. And, like, the crowds are just molten hot for the Fantastics. It's it's 
Awesome stuff. Awesome, awesome stuff. And in the midst of that, too, uh, one of the all-time great tag matches of the 80s is is, is the Crockett Cup uh, comes in. I don't know if you were going to get to that uh, in a sec, but that's in the midst of that as they go you know, participate in the, in the uh, Jim Crockett promotions, you know, Crockett Cup. And then the main event is the Fantastic versus the Sheep Herders uh, in the quarterfinals, I should say. Uh, it's a double DQ uh, to kind of get them both out of the tournament, but that's a fantastic match. I believe five stars from Dave, if I'm not. Yes. If I, if, if, am famous- I mistaken that? Is that the five star one? Nope, that's the one. That's the famous five-star match that the Bushwhackers had from Dave Meltzer, which everybody talks about. But it's like, um, because like, oh my God, the Bushwhackers had a five... Because the big thing for many years was the Bushwhackers have a five-star match and Brian Danielson does not. (laughs) Right, right. It's not true anymore, but that was the case for many years. But people, you know, if you... Look, that match is on YouTube, but clipped. And I'm not even positive I've ever seen a complete version. I don't know if the version on the network is complete either. I think it's heavily clipped. Of the, no, it's heavily clipped, if I remember correctly. Yeah, because that Crockett Cup show on the network, I believe, comes right off the home video, which is all clipped, you know, all throughout. But I can't remember if I've ever seen the... the un, but look, if you watch that match now, is it going to look like a five-star match in 2023? It's not. Okay, it's not. But... It was 1986, and it was, uh, you know, a stark dichotomy from the kind of matches the Fantastics were having with people with teams like the Midnight Express and 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 that, you know, and, and it was very impressive that the Fantastics were able. And now look, this was all while they were having these wild brawls in all of these gimmick matches in Mid South against the the Sheep Herders. This was an ongoing feud, but yeah, that's a. Uh, that's a very infamous Dave Meltzer five-star match. That match from the Crockett Cup, which, quite honestly, is probably the most, it's without a doubt, the most famous Sheep Herders match. There's no doubt about that. Is it the famous and most well-known Fantastics match? That might be more debatable because you could probably, you, there's a couple contenders against the Midnight. Yeah, Express I would. No, I would say some of those Midnight. Class of Champions. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Those uh, Midnight matches are are, are, are are probably a bigger deal. But uh, but a, a very famous match from the era, nonetheless, and and a match that I think did it make Kevin Hare and Robin Reed's hundred that she uh, the wrestling one hundred and one. Let me, I don't know, and I don't know that we fully listed off the rest of the the con- I see, let me double message check. one message message those guys and see if they'll answer us before the end of the show. I'm curious if they picked that. I think, match. I, think I might have access um, to the, uh, the the master list. I'm not supposed to reveal it, but, but I, could, um, I could try <laughs> here. So, uh, no, and, and the other thing, too, about going back, and if you want to watch some of these matches, you might be thinking, ah, it's like 80s wrestling or whatever. And it, it, just trust me, if you don't know anything about 80s wrestling, you, you're, you're listening to this and you're a, a relatively newer fan, I'm telling you, these matches are so action packed. Like, find any of these Fantastic versus Sheep Herders matches. I've watched a couple of them. We talked, we watched a bunch of them for our UWF uh, deep dive, which I'll link in, in the show description. They're there. Uh, or you just look at just, Go on YouTube and look up Fantastic versus the Sheep Herders. You, a, a, a myth about old wrestling or how wrestling was supposed to be or whatever. Another, you always talk about WWE myths and how they just kind of created a myth of what wrestling was and what good wrestling is and what wrestling was and, and should be and all this sort of stuff. The, the bell rings and these matches are 16 minutes long and they don't fucking stop. These guys are beating on each other, running, drop kicking, punching, kicking, throwing each other. Every second of those 16 minutes is filled up. There's nobody putting anybody in a side headlock and rearing it in or whatever. That's not what wrestling is. Like somewhere along the line, we decided that that that's what wrestling was. And then people think that classic wrestling is that. No, no, no. These guys, the bell rings, and they guys are fucking balls to the wall from the moment it starts to the moment it ends. And it's a sheep herder. So it's like, no, they're not out there doing Vikingo commander stuff, but they're kicking and they're punching or they're tagging or they're doing something. Every second of a rest of, of those matches between the Fantastics, something is happening. Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers are either tagging, drop kicking, or getting punched or getting kicked or whatever, but something is happening in every single second of those matches. And the crowds are going fucking wild the entire time dude. I, I i cannot recommend them enough if you're if you're listening to this and you've never seen any of those fantastic sheep herders matches and you can really you, you really can't go wrong honestly go watch one of them whatever ones you can find watch it because you will be stunned and blown away by just how good the work is i, I really do think they hold up and like you said do they hold up to 2023 standards i, I kind of think they do like i watched a bunch of them today and i think they're still really fucking great i think they're tremendous matches yeah so they lose the feud to the Fantastics. They leave the territory, Mid South, 
and then they bounce around. They they go back to Memphis. They of course, they, you know, I'm sure they went back to Puerto Rico around this time. Uh, so I can you know, tell Florida, you, sorry not where, to not to butt in. Uh, the Midnight's no, and the Fantastics were in the uh, the Clash of the '80s uh, that we did release already. Wrestling 101. Uh, the wrestling 101.com if you want to listen to those voices wrestling.com or, or read those uh, at voices wrestling.com so the midnights and the fantastics did make it uh that was a series that were released uh, a couple of uh, months ago clashes of the 80s well that one i knew would be in it i'm just curious if uh they they the 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 sheep herders versus the fantastic yeah it does not look like rocket cup made it yeah, it is not i didn't think it did either um so then they bounced around you know various territories and then went back to the UWF in 87. So, you know, they lost a few to the Fantastics. And now this was classic, you know, territory stuff where you would lose a feud. And then there's like, there's nothing left to do, right? So you disappear for a while. You go to other places and and you start fresh and then you come back a year later and then, you know, you feel fresh in that territory again. So they had another run through the UWF in the dying days. And I believe they were there for the purchase, which is how they ended up with WCW. Yes, because exactly. They were a part of the, yeah. So they come in with, you know, Rick Steiner and Terry Taylor and Eddie Gilbert and Steve Williams and whoever else was still of, of you know, maybe like Brad Armstrong, probably uh, maybe even Tim Horner, people like that who were with mid South uh, who were with the UWF when Watts sold to WCW and they brought in, you know, those guys, they totally, they didn't really take advantage, like most promoters don't, of any kind of interpromotional or, or invasion sort of thing. Um, but all those guys did come in and they get they, they got integrated into the roster and, and the sheep herders were among them. And this is where they were about to have their, like we talked about at the top, their third feud with the Fantastics, which they had started but never, you know, because they left in the middle of the tournament and everything. And that's kind of where we we picked up the segment because you know they jump in december of 88 november or december of 88 to the wwf and then do the bushwhacker thing uh, to close out the twilight of their careers and it's uh it's interesting to me i'm I'm curious who came up with the bushwhacker gimmick because these guys never worked babyface and who would have thought that they could have been a big hit with children and doing a complete you know 180 on what they've been doing for their for four de- for nearly four decades you know these across guys were, the world too not just in like a, a one territory like across the fucking world these guys were bloodthirsty snarling disgusting guys that were just like i mean look at them you, like especially looking at like you see them i remember as a kid seeing those guys i'm like oh my god like they're just grotesque humans like they're they're they're, they're just spitting and snarling. Their foreheads are all caved in and stuff. And it's like, here, lick my child. And, and like li- adults, like adult people being like, here, here's my baby. Lick their forehead. And then people did. And that's and they were over as fuck. They were huge. I don't know. that. Uh, uh, I, I'll say. I mean, it, it, it. what a wild idea to have them do that. I, I don't know if it was just a challenge or they wanted to. The, no idea. No idea if that was Vince or, or or them themselves that just decided to do it. But holy shit. And then it worked. It worked great. <laughs> like it was a, like not great in terms of in ring. Like there's nothing. There's nothing that I could say as a highlight uh, from the Bushwhackers running the WWF. But like we always say, I mean, they made more money than they ever made, you know, during that time. So, you know, good to them. And they didn't have to mutilate their bodies anymore. They could go out there and do their little arm thing and and come out and have basic ass matches and go ah, 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 on promos. And they were fine. And that's all they had to do and make a shit ton of money. So good for them. And they were able to keep that going for like you said like almost like 15 years basically they were able to survive in, in, in the wwf so or at least you know r- roughly 10 years maybe right around 10 years but close um, to the 10 close to the 10 yeah, yeah close to the 10 but man like which, which in those days is a super long run right I mean, right right now these guys stay there for 10 15 years routinely but back then you know these guys would come in stay a year and a half two years two and a half years and then they'd be out and you remember them as iconic Hall of Fame performers in that company. And, you know, they were there for three years. You know, it was very rare to stay like eight, eight years, 10 years, the way that these guys did. And they didn't really change their look at all. They came in with the same gear, the same look. Um, they just completely changed their style. And I wonder if that was the the Vince McMahon's idea, if that was Pat Patterson, if it was their own. I don't know how they came up with it, but it worked. Uh, again, they never really got pushed very hard. I mean, they never advanced any higher than the mid card. 
I don't even remember them getting a lot of title matches. And yeah, they I did, was I was looking it, at that right now to see, uh, as we were saying, if they it ever would have probably been house shows or maybe Saturday night's main event level stuff. But yeah, let me see if they have any TV. Certainly not pay per views. No, like no, that. no. It, yeah, yeah. It looks like on uh, total they had a. a, a title match against the Nasty Boys in 1991 for the uh, tag titles on Saturday Night's main event. On an episode of Primetime, they had a title shot at Money, Inc. Uh, and then in 1994, they had a shot at... Uh, oh, sorry, that was a tournament. Uh, they lost uh, in the tournament to the Heavenly Bodies. And then they were also in a tournament and lost to the Body Donnas uh, for the tag team. So, so essentially, they had, what, a, almost an eight- or nine-year run, uh, had two tag title shots on TV ever, Money, Inc. and Nasty Boys, and that was it. They would lose all the push teams, and if when they would beat teams, you knew it was trouble for those teams, like they were on their way out or working their way down the card. Um, and they would feud with the other prelim level teams. Like I know they had a feud with like Well Done, you know, uh, towards the end of their <laughs> yeah, run, which yeah. was just a to- a total prelim level feud. You know what I mean? Like they would feud with teams like that, um, but they were a constant presence and and they were there for some lean years, but even during those lean WWF years, that was still the place where you were going to make the most money. Uh, but, and, but they came in at the end of the Hulkamania era. So I'm sure they made some big money in nine in 89, 90, you know, at, at the tail end of, of the fumes of the, the end of the Hulkamania era. So, and that was really it for, you know, they worked some Indies and then, you know, um, a lot of people might not remember this, but they had that really short run in ECW around 1998 or 1999 where they were um, the, the, it was like a comedy deal where they were like part of the Dudleys. Um, And then that was really it for, for Butch. I mean, you know, he wrapped it up uh, a few years after that and Luke kept going and Luke is still going to this day. And then Luke, you know what? What's interesting about Luke uh, Luke Williams is he had that very short run with ECW, and then he had a run with Ring of Honor. Like in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, he would he would, you know, he he worked maybe just a handful of comedy matches with like Grizzly Redwood and people like that. But uh, you know, he would work prelims. I know he worked a prelim match at WrestleMania weekend in Houston in two thousand nine because I was at that show. Um, but he would be at all of the shows, even if he didn't wrestle. He would sign autographs. He would do like the Goodwill Ambassador mm-hmm. deal because he was friends with Carrie Silken. So that was the connection there. So he would always be around Ring of Honor in the late aughts, you know, 08, 09, maybe into 2010. So when you look at it, what's crazy is Luke Williams is one of the handful of people who worked for ECW and Ring of Honor. Yeah, and 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 what's bizarre about it is Luke of the Bushwhackers is one of them. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and that's like if there was a Sporkle quiz, <laughs> that's the one nobody gets, right? Like, like, why would you even think about like, like you you would probably a lot of people probably don't know he he worked for either of right. Companies. I wouldn't be able to get either let probably alone. before a couple weeks ago when I was doing research about it. So, you know, let alone both, you know. But um, yeah, and that was really it, and. Um, you know, they, they won tag team titles in the vast majority of these territories. Like, let's see, they definitely won the UWF tag team titles. I'm sure they won the tag titles in Puerto Rico a million times. Um, Stampede, I know. Uh, uh, I'm sure they won the titles. Oh, 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 definitely for Blanchard for 100%. Um, the, the Boyd version, Boyd and Williams in, in, um, for Joe Blanchard. So, Oh, and obviously for, uh, for Don Owen, because that they came in and immediately won the titles from Adonis and star. So, and then traded the titles with uh, Piper and Martell a million times. So, you know, basically everywhere they went, they would come in, they'd be these, these, these brawling heels. They would win the tag titles. They'd work a program with whoever your, you know, good looking baby face tag team was the fabulous ones, the fantastics, you know, you go right down the line and uh, then they'd have, eventually lose the feud and they'd move on and that was the beauty of the territories right that was the beauty right next town to do the next thing the exact same thing over and over and over again and it didn't matter because that crowd did not know that you just did that in san antonio you know what i mean they didn't know that you just did the exact same thing in san antonio come to town and bloody up our 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 baby face blowjob tag team or whatever but they could do that in every single town over and over and over again and draw a shit ton of money every single time 
Yeah. So, um, and I just think it's so great that while one version was in Puerto Rico, another version was in the mainland US, <laughs> student, and they were both yeah. working concurrently doing the same gimmick at the same time, you know, and that was really brilliant with, with their, with the blessing, like there was no, like they weren't ripoffs. It was with the blessing of, of Miller and Williams. It wasn't like Boyd and Morgan were just, it was some rogue act, you know, it was very much like giant Kimala too, Ben Peacock, where, the original Kamala knew full well that the guy was doing that and, and he was okay with it. You know what I mean? It's not like there was heat there. It's like, all right, well, if, if you're going to stay in Japan, like how does that affect me in the United States working all these territories, you do your thing, you know? And when I pop up for Baba, we can team together. And, you know, that was my match of the week, the week before, you know, the two giant Kamala's teaming together with Abdul, the butcher, you know, and, you know, so it, it's not like this was a contentious thing either. These guys were all sheep herders. You know, they were all a part of the act, you know, throughout the years. But, um, yeah, I would just say I'm, I'm going to do that that thing that people have done for years. If you only know them as the Bushwhackers, which a lot, I'm sure a lot of people do, it's it's well worth your time to, to dig in a little and check out the match of the week this week and let that be your guide and then watch all the Portland stuff. And then uh, if you're on our Discord, you know, I linked that um, that great YouTube playlist that yeah. has just stuff from everywhere, Memphis and 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 Porter, tons of stuff from Puerto Rico and and all the all, all the territories we just talked about. And this really was a team that, you know, the Bushwhacker thing was kind of a second life and, you know, good for them for working half as hard and oh and yeah, yeah. Twice there, the there's money. several there's several guys in WWE history and we talked about it when coco uh, with coco beware all the time that like that's a dude who if you only knew him from wf you know him as the guy with the bird or whatever but it's like dude this guy's a fucking incredible worker but like yeah he made a lot of money by dancing around and carrying a bird and it's like all right you, you know you can't knock the hustle that's a great way to make money and the, yeah the bushwhackers made a shit ton of money you know, moving their arms back and forth and, and making funny noises and licking people. Hey, good for them, man. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely good for them. But uh, it does kind of, unfortunately, a lot of people just know them as those guys uh, and, and might look at you funny if you're like, no, 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 these guys were like great workers. I promise, I promise, I promise. Uh, you got to go back and watch that stuff. And there's plenty, like, that YouTube playlist is perfect. But you can honestly just look up the Sheep Herders, you know, versus whoever. And, and, and like you said, maybe start with the match of the week as your guide on, on you know, our, our, it's on our Discord and also uh, patreon.com uh, slash voices of wrestling. Start there and then just kind of, yeah, bounce around everywhere. Hey, go to the deep dive. Like we said, the UWF tag team title deep dive if you want to see some of those fantastics uh, matches as well. But yeah, just just watch stuff. I mean, just just you, you, you'll gain a whole new appreciation for those guys and, and, and what they were able to do. And honestly, it makes me appreciate them a little bit more as the Bushwhackers because it's like, oh, these guys worked their asses off to get to the point where they could, you know, slack off and make a ton of money. So good for them. You have anything else on uh, the passing of uh, Butch Miller? I don't. I don't. Yeah, I'll just implore people. It is not hard to find stuff from them. So, so make it your mission this weekend. If 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 nothing else from from this segment that we just did, know that these guys had a much 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 larger career than the Bushwhackers. And and if you've never seen anything non Bushwhackers, hell, maybe you've never even seen the Bushwhackers. You know, go go watch some Sheep Herder stuff. Sheep Herder is fantastic. Like I said, you cannot go wrong. Watch anything from that playlist. You can't go wrong. Watch the match of the week uh, this week at uh, flagshippatreon.com. Uh, you can't go wrong that way either. But yeah, just just your goal this weekend, watch some sheep herders and, and, and really understand you know what these guys wore and why they are, are, are so well-renowned and, and, and so well-known around the world for, for the work they did. So 